latest crime statistics are out for the peninsula. Liz Brown Swanson joins us from the Lameda Sheriff Station with the details. Well, we've had a great start to 2014. All of our uh, Part 1 crimes, our serious, significant crimes, are down from uh, the previous year, which is great news. It's always the, the way we want crime statistics to go. Uh, our uh, auto thefts are down significantly. They're down 70% this first quarter of 2014 from where they were last year, and so we're very uh, very pleased with our numbers. Is there anything you can attribute to the, to the decrease in crime right now you're seeing? Well, we've had a few significant arrests uh, for auto theft and also for burglary that you know we believe have helped curb the crime and also just uh, the information getting out through our neighborhood watch program and uh, having the citizens be uh, you know more aware of their surroundings uh, locking their vehicles taking their and securing their personal uh, items out of their vehicles uh, securing their home and then calling us and reporting suspicious activity in their neighborhood all of that has contributed to the uh, decline in crime Excellent. You have patrols out all over the community all the time. One type of patrol that's out there that's really helping are your bike patrols. Talk a little bit about those and how that's working out. Well, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes has been very uh, uh, generous in providing uh, us with the, uh, the patrols and the resources that we can go out on bicycles, particularly on the Western Avenue corridor for the businesses. And we are able to go out there, you know, uh, a couple times a month and, uh, you know, for visibility for uh, interacting with the community and also as a deterrent to crime because those bicycles can navigate in and out of areas where it's more difficult to from a vehicle. So uh, we've been very pleased with the results. The community has been very appreciative and receptive to that and we anticipate uh, in the coming months being more visible on our bicycles. Excellent. Anything you want to add that you want the residents on the on the peninsula to know about in terms of how you are doing your job to help keep us all safe and anything they can do to help you? Well, like I said, they can uh, continue to uh, secure their vehicles, uh, lock them, take your personal uh, items out, and also a, a personal thank you to the community for me for their support uh, of the men and women at Lomita Sheriff Station. Emergency preparedness is always a top priority in the community. The latest 4.4 earthquake to jolt the Southland reminds all of us about the importance of being prepared for a much larger quake. I caught up with the chair of the RPV Emergency Preparedness Committee, Tim Weiner, who tells us it's not a matter of if an earthquake hits our community, but when. Rancho Palos Verdes actually has a few unique challenges because of its geography. Um, the one that the Emergency Preparedness Committee talks about the most is water and how important it is for people to have water on hand. All of the um, water that we have from the tap is pumped up to the top of the hill and then it's gravity fed to the homes. Mm -hmm. And so in the event of a major earthquake, there could be a loss of electricity, the pipes could break, and whatever water is sort of in the system is, is all we're going to have access to, and that will be gone very quickly. Mm -hmm. And because we're so isolated, you know, uh, we've all seen what happens if there's a car accident on Crenshaw Boulevard or if right. a truck stalls on Hawthorne Boulevard. Well, if there's a major earthquake and those arteries are blocked, it could be a long time before we get relief up here. So we encourage people to have seven to ten days worth of food and water, uh, you know, non-perishable food and water. And it's real easy to do. You can get the trays of water at Costco or a place like that. Um, if you get Arrowhead or Sparklets, you can order a few extra bottles and just cycle them through. So it's easy to do and it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm absolutely critical to have a plan and what I always tell people you should do is write up the plan make copies of it and put a copy in your car keep a copy at the office keep a copy at home so no matter where you are you can open up that plan and the plan can be something very simple sort of a list of places we're gonna meet we're gonna try to meet at home if we can't meet at home we're gonna meet at Peninsula Center if we can't meet at Peninsula Center we're gonna meet at you know a certain store at Del Amo and sort of as the circles get bigger you need to have you know different places where you're trying to get as close to home as possible mm -hmm. but you might not be able to make it I work in downtown Los Angeles you know I'm gonna try to get home right. but it's 25 miles mm -hmm. I might not be able to make it so our plan you know we have different places you know that we've predetermined that we're gonna try to meet okay. I mean obviously that uh, one of the problems with cell phones is you're gonna need to keep it fully charged right so a cell phone if the battery's not working won't be of any help uh, cell phone towers do have uh, limited 
battery backup capabilities. So they should come online first. They should come online relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And also the phone companies have the capability of bringing in mobile cell towers uh, like on a temporary basis. Um, for, for landlines and stuff like that, a lot of people have replaced their landlines with the cell phone. Right. But for those of us who still have landlines, I always tell people it's real important to make sure you have an actual physical phone as opposed to just the cordless phones mm -hmm. because the cordless base units require electricity, whereas the normal telephone does not. It can draw power off of the, the actual phone line. So if there's no electricity but the phone lines are working, you need to have an old style phone to make use of them. One of the things that the city council has been extremely supportive of for years now is that every year we purchase a large number of emergency backpacks mm -hmm. and the city subsidizes those for Rancho Palos Verdes residents. They're available at the Interpretive Center for a nominal cost and they have a three-day supply of emergency food, water, and just you know various emergency supplies. They're great for your car and your office. <laughs> All residents are encouraged to attend monthly meetings held by the Emergency Preparedness Committee at the RPV City Hall. They are every third Thursday. For more information on emergency preparedness, you can go to the city's website at palosverdes.com rpv. Now it's time to catch up with the RPV Mayor, Jerry Dehovic. Liz Brown Swanson sat down with the mayor to discuss recent concerns about the city's coastal specific plan. <music> Coastal specific plan that mm. talk explain that to the residents what that is if they've never heard of it and it came up um, uh, the last couple of meetings. It did. Well, the coastal specific plan is is a document that was created by the city in 1978 in response to the California Coastal Act of 1976, which required coastal cities to have a plan. Ours is called the coastal specific plan, and it deals with coastal districts. Um, in our particular case, ours is defined and, and has been accepted by the Coastal Commission as the seaward side of all RPV property from Palos Verdes Drive West seaward and Palos Verdes Drive South seaward. That is our coastal district. And the coastal specific plan talks about uh, preserving views and, and gives us guidance as far as development and usage of the land in the coastal district. So what we had was a um, an applicant who wanted to build a home uh, um, on PV Drive West uh, that went through a very long process of, of uh, trying to get their plans approved and it met with with a significant amount of, of um, uh, resident input and objection and the, the whole issue here uh, in my mind was one of fairness. The, the coastal specific plan, the way it's written, is, is fairly ambiguous and, and there's a lot of subjectivity as to interpretation. It's been around for, you know, what I say 70, that's 22, that's 36 years. It gives guidance on, for example, the biggest primary issue is what they call a viewing station. Where is it that you're going to uh, uh, define what view it is you're going to protect? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of subjectivity to that and there's been different interpretations of the same thing over the course of the years. Uh, some would argue that those are erroneous interpretations, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. I think I heard day. something about like, if you're, like the site level, if you're driving in a car in PV Drive, like that would be considered sort of the that, view that's expected to be protected. Is that, that right? That's a good one. And uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are very few, and I, I think that's probably the most basic one, but there, I think Councilman Knight brought up the fact that there may be certain trails that actually would need to be protected versus the driving view on PV Drive West or South, but that's primarily right. it. And the discussion is we need to define the viewing station. And there's a fog line, which is basically, if you want to think about it, the bike lane, the white line on the bike lane on PV Drive West or South, three feet above that, which should probably be the average sitting height of somebody in a car. And, and give that parameter and, and tell applicants that this is the benchmark, this is where we're going to start from. Instead of backing into it or saying, well, it's going to be seven feet or you know, the average person is five foot four to five foot eleven. There's a lot of nuance that has gone into past decisions. We want to give explicit direction so an applicant doesn't get caught up in, in the same type of thing we had in this particular case. Right. And you can see more with our mayor on RPV City Talk, which airs every day at 9 p.m. And coming up next, our local businesses came together to celebrate a job well done and one local charity celebrates in style at their annual fundraiser. We'll be right back. Hi there. 
I'm Dee Dee Daniels, and I've been a personal trainer for almost three decades. Please join me on Peninsula Fitness, a 30-minute daily workout to get yourself moving. Sometimes we're seated, sometimes not. Sometimes we're calm and relaxed, and sometimes the workout is high energy. Be sure to tune in every day to see what we're up to. All the workouts are safe and effective, and best of all, I can be your personal trainer right in your home. Not only do you work out with me, but sometimes my colleagues join us in the studio and we do a specialty workout, like Christine here who's taking me through some kickboxing moves. Don't worry, that kick was not part of the show. So join me, Dee Dee Daniels, every day on Peninsula Fitness, and let's get moving. I'll see you soon. The number of adults living with attention deficit disorder continues to grow. One of those adults is Rancho Palos Verdes resident Justine Rotolo, who calls herself Miss ADD. Justine, a counselor and author of the book ADD Land, offers a local support group for adults. Liz Brown Swanson caught up with the group. Our PD resident with me now, she is, calls herself Miss ADD. That's right. And you are a marriage family therapist, you are a life coach, you are an author, and you've been dealing with uh, folks with ADD for, for decades. 20 years, yes. And so why don't we just start with you sharing your, um, your story, how yeah. you're Miss ADD. Okay, I'd love to. So I recognize now, looking back, that my childhood was very difficult in terms of school and making friends and as I got older into adolescent years and young adults, a lot of difficulty with emotional regulation, being able to regulate my emotions, being able to focus on things. College was a disaster, almost failed out, but I really did ac actually the last year make it through, which was wonderful. And I could never, looking back, I could never really figure this out because I always saw myself as being a very intelligent person, but I saw everybody else around me moving forward, and I just wasn't. I wasn't really putting one foot in front of the other. I want to talk to you about um, what you do here at the Center for Learning Unlimited every week to. on Wednesday nights. Yes. You have a support group. Yes. Tell us about that group. It's I started this group four years ago with about three people in the group. And what I started to, to do is to share the mindfulness. For those of you who are watching who don't really understand that, Mindfulness is all about staying in the moment. When we run to the future, it causes anxiety. When we go to the past, it causes depression. But in the moment, for me and for a lot of people, because this is actually an evidence-based therapy at this point, there's focus. Um, I met Justine originally as a, like a life coach, and um, she had told me that she was doing this program this uh, weekly ADD support group. And I said, I don't have ADD, but I came anyways and um, discovered that I do have ADD. I always saw ADD as um, kids who couldn't pay attention in school, who were constantly on the move and on the go, um, couldn't you know follow directions. And I didn't really see myself as that way. Came here back in May of 2011. And what brought me here was uh, probably a year before I'd heard about Chad which is children and adults with ADD, and had procrastinated and was busy with so many other things, and I just kept on putting it off. And it was my wife who strongly encouraged me to do this, and it finally came to a head where she was, you know, not, not making an ultimatum, but she was making it very clear, you gotta do something, and she was right. So I called a good friend of mine, and he came with me the very first time, and been coming ever since. It's really been, a great help for me. The support group meets every Wednesday night at 7.30 at the Center for Learning Unlimited in Torrance. For more information, you can log on to MissADD.com. Now, every year, the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce gathers for the Business Awards. This year, the event was held at Trump National Golf Club. Now, the awards recognize local businesses who are making a difference in our community. Here's more from the gala. We're very excited to be here at beautiful Trump National Golf Club, as always. Um, the awards are actually come from nominations from chamber members, and so they submit nominations for other businesses, um, 
talking about things that might distinguish the business, um, achievements, accomplishments, involvement in the community. And then a committee of members actually reviews all of those nominations anonymously and um, makes recommendations to the board of directors as to who should be honored each year. We're honored to have with us this evening um, State Senator Ted Liu and LA County Supervisor Don Kanabi. Um, and they always um, you know, are, are very entertaining and engaging and very supportive of our local businesses and our community in general. So we're appreciative to have them here tonight as well as great support from the City Council of the City of Rancho Palos Verdes, the City of Rolling Hills Estates and Palos Verdes Estates as well. So we really appreciate um, all of our local electeds participation. Well I mean I always think it's nice when a Chamber of Commerce can take the time to honor their members actually. But I think more importantly, particularly up here in the peninsula, uh, it, you know, it's not an easy place to get to or to leave. And so the local business has really become an important part of the community because you just don't want to run all the way down the hill or, you know, those kinds of things. So the fact that they're taking the time, they, each year they honor different sized businesses, uh, new awards for new businesses. So they always seem to be an encourager uh, of their businesses. And I'll tell you what, Palsworth's Chamber, I must get two emails a day from them. So. They're always, you know, either new creative ideas or ways to help their local businesses, and they nurture that, and I think it's really important. I think that the Chamber in the more recent years has really been doing a fantastic job of recognizing new businesses in our community, but also the other people in the community who are providing all of the support to those businesses, particularly the volunteers and the philanthropic organizations that really kind of make a complete business community. And I don't think that aspect of it gets recognized as that often, so it's very nice to see our chamber doing that. And it's, it's kind of cool because we all have favorite places that we like to go to here on the hill. And a lot of people, they want to stay in our community. They do. I mean, it's so funny how people act like driving into the rest of the South Bay is going to the ends of the earth. So it is nice when we can provide goods and services and uh, places like Trump National for people to go and, and spend their tax dollars uh, locally. So we like that. And Trump National Golf Club has been very busy hosting another grand gala, this time for the PV Juniors. The Juniors are a local charity who raise money to support women and children in crisis throughout the South Bay. This year the fundraiser was entitled Night of Thrones and I was there for all the fun. We, uh with the money we raised tonight, we end up giving money to shelters like Rainbow Shelter. We help women with their infant children uh, find safe homes and probably what we would call a second shot in life because they, many of them have been homeless. Uh, we are supporting Trinity Kids. Uh, there is uh, one of the most horrific things a parent could ever face is to uh, be dealing with a terminally ill child and we help them by ensuring that they get the proper help during those very difficult times. All right. 100% of the proceeds go to our charities. And, 100%. And how long has it taken you to put all of this together? All year. <laughs> all year. The juniors are a great organization. Um, the uh, juniors have been around 56 years. They, they work philanthropically to raise money for women and children in crisis primarily mm -hmm. and uh, they they have several large fundraising efforts throughout the year and they raise money for usually six or seven local charities there is a process by which they select worthy charities there's so many of them and so many in need of money uh, but they have a committee that goes through that process but they're all local charities so the uh, the juniors work very hard to support local philanthropic uh, organizations. And of course you're very close to this charity because your wife Roseanne is one of the juniors and you ha have basket parties and things at your house going on so you see it firsthand. She is a very involved junior. I think this is the third year in a row that we've uh, acted as a um, staging ground if you will mm -hmm. for all the baskets and donated items and uh, I'm a lucky guy for the last two or three weeks I've had 20, 30, 40, 50 women at my house every night. I come home everyone gives me a big hi honey and uh, <laughs> Um, how was your day? But uh, yeah, it really is something to see when you see that uh, that spirit and that charitable heart and the esprit de corps and the camaraderie and uh, uh, all the good wine getting drank there. It's uh, 
it's, it's fantastic. They really work hard and you know, people don't really realize, maybe some do, how hard it is to put something like this on. There is so many moving parts and, uh, and they all step up and work very, very hard on it. Those ladies sure work hard. Now, if you would like more information on the PV Juniors, you can go to their website at pvjuniors.org. And when we come back, you can start your day out with a whale of a time and finish it at Yosemite. We're going to tell you how, so don't go away. Hi, I'm Deputy Chris Knox, here to remind you of the importance of traffic safety near our schools. School zones are always 25 miles per hour. The school zone only applies when students are outside the school in the morning and the afternoon. Parents should always allow extra time when dropping off their children and should know the school's drop-off routes and procedures. Motorists should also focus on safe driving near schools. Some of the violations I see near schools are cell phones, speeding, double parking, seat belts, and child safety seats. Students should always remember to cross safely at intersections and not to run out in front of cars. When we follow these rules, we can all stay safe. The 30th annual Whale of a Day celebration is happening on Saturday, April the 5th from 10 to 4 at the Palos Verdes Interpretive Center. Now the event usually takes place the first weekend of March, but had to be postponed due to heavy rain. Liz Brown Swanson has more on the upcoming Whale of a Day event. Hi Maria, yes this is the first time in the city's history that Whale of a Day had to be rescheduled. The good news is it's moving forward like you said on April 5th Saturday and joining me now with the city's Rec and Parks Department is Mona Dill. She is the Whale of a Day coordinator. It's so great to talk with you. Very exciting that Whale of a Day was able to be rescheduled to April 5th. You're ready for it. You bet we are Liz. Bring it on. <laughs> what, tell us what's on board for this year's Whale of a Day. I think most of the public is going to find that things haven't changed one bit. We have every single one of our organizations, which is over 22, with the exception of one that can't join us for this whale of a day. All of our entertainment is going to be the same, so we're anticipating just another great whale of a day. Whale of a Day is a celebration of the migration of the whales. Talk a little bit about that, how it all got started, and why we do this year after year. Well, of course... PVIC is one of the most premier whale watching centers that we have on our California coast. So that's reason to celebrate just by itself. So we really are celebrating the, you know, the migration of the whales starting up in Alaska and the Chukchi Seas all the way down to the San Ignacio Lagoons down in Cabo San Lucas. So it really is something to celebrate. And these whales really cooperate every whale of a day. There's definitely the bell is ringing and those whales do come by. That is absolutely <laughs> correct. For the most part, they're going to be heading north at this point in time, but they're still going to be out there. And of course, when Whale of a Day comes, you co-sponsor it with the group Los Serenos de Point Vicente. They are the docent group that's here volunteering daily to help run the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Talk about their role and the fact that you co-host with this group. Well, Los Serenos is Whale of a Day. Really, it's all about them and on the countless volunteers and the countless hours that they put in. So we, the city just provides the support and the location, and really, they do all the hard work. So kudos to them. They're an awesome group. There's really something here for the whole family. Absolutely. And we have lots of entertainment, too. We have our Dance for Oceans Dancing Trash Zombies again. We've got our cloggers back. We've got uh, PV strings with our little violinists and their little whale tail hats, which is kind of fun. We also have a, a great surf band music called the Guitars, which has been very popular the last few years. So everybody's back. It should be a hoot. One other thing, new opportunity when people come here is there's a surprise out in the back patio. The Palos Verdes Peninsula Rotary Club has made a donation and talk about um, the new addition to this year's Whale of a Day. This is such an exciting uh, addition that we have coming. We have a fixed set of binoculars, so you'll be able to go out on the back patio and for free and look around, and you'll be able to see much further than you could with a naked eye or even with our borrowed binoculars. So that's going to be great. And of course, a great tip for those coming to Whale of a Day, when you're on that back patio, you'll see a lot of members from the American Cetacean Society. Society. They're the census takers here, counting the whales. Yeah, the American Cetacean Society, boy, what a dedicated group. They're here bright and early, and they're here till the sun goes down. So they're here counting away. So this is our third best year in 30 years now. So that's really exciting. Anything important that you want to add to let people know other than to come on down, especially about how they get down here? That's correct. So parking is very limited here at the Interpretive Center. So we're going to have a free shuttle up from uh, Rancho Palos Verde City Hall and it'll be coming by about every 10 minutes so that's how people will arrive here 10 to 4 we hope everybody can join us 
we know it's going to be a great time. I'm looking forward to hanging out with you, great. Mona Dill. Thanks for all you do for the city. Really important community event. One of the one of my favorite events for everyone to enjoy. Again, the 30th annual Whale of a Day will be held right here at PVIC from 10 to 4, and we want to see you there. And check out the website whaleofaday.com. Back to you, Maria. <laughs> And remember, there's lots of free parking right here at RPV City Hall. We hope to see you out there for well of a day. And finally, we have a double header on tap for you. That's right, on Saturday, April the 5th, right after you've had fun at Well of a Day, it's time for dinner and a movie. The Palos Verdes Land Conservancy will show a feature presentation on Yosemite at the Warner Grand Theater. I sat down with the Executive Director of the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy, Andrea Vona, who tells us more. We're so excited to be launching a film series this year um, called The Beauty of Nature and our first screening will be on April 5th at the historic Warner Grand Theater in San Pedro and it is a film um, celebrating Yosemite's 150th anniversary and it's made by the renowned documentarian Ken Burns and it illustrates the um, the movement to preserve Yosemite and the people, notably John Muir, who inspired the preservation of that this majestic place. And we're excited through the Land Conservancy to be bringing this film to our community um, as we conclude our 25th anniversary. There's a lot of parallels between the the activism, the community interest, the perseverance that led to the preservation of Yosemite um, as we're experiencing in modern day through um, community networking and collaborations with our um, local cities and governments to preserve open space here on the peninsula. So um, after the screening of Yosemite on April 5th, there will be um, more films coming. We will be screening Riding Giants at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium John Olguin Auditorium and Rivers and Tides will be presented by the Art Center at the Art Center um, as well as uh, More Than Honey at the Peninsula Center Library in the community room and Kuntiki where we will be back again at the Warner Grand Theater in November. Information is available on our website at pvplc.org. Tickets are $10 for the Yosemite film and free to students 18 and under, so it's a great thing to bring families and we hope that we'll have um, young people there as well. And the, um, the re remaining films, with the exception of Kontiki, are all free and Kontiki is also $10 at the Warner Grand. And tickets are available for the films that are for a fee at our website pvplc.org. And I should also note that the Rivers and Tides movie is sort of um, going to be done with a box dinner style and reservations are required through the Art Center for that film. So after Yosemite, since it's a fairly early in the evening, we thought it would be nice to have a dinner option. So there's an option to pre-purchase a meal for Neil's Restaurant, which is in, within walking distance of the theater. And um, there are several choices for the entree. Tickets are available on our website for that as well and it's $40 for the meal at Neal's. Um, and we should be gathering around 5.30 at the restaurant after the film has concluded. And RPV TV will be there with a special documentary on the Land Conservancy. You won't want to miss that. And for more information on tickets, you can go to the website at pvplc.org. And that will do it for us. From everyone here at RPV TV, make it a great day.